بين ادم اللي خان اردام قم قرا بثا حنوني شاف اخسي حاضر وش سليحا ما اذنها اذوني ريحة سطار وقالت احار بطير ميميم بونيم ومهر عروس لعزراء لفني شوخ معونيم ومبيشع وغام ريشع براح وفحاد مأسونيم أن شعيش مخايد the history of the Jews of Iraq can be traced back to 586 BC when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon exiled the Jewish people from the land of Judea to Babylon, which is now present-day Iraq. That transition we know was very hard because there's a psalm in the Bible that describes the experience. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat sat and wept as we thought of Zion. The, the language in Iraq is Arabic and uh, we studied Arabic in school but we had a different dialect, different than the Muslims because they lived among themselves for so many years. There's two, three kinds of dialect in Baghdad. There are Muslim that speaks different dialect, there is the Jewish dialect and then there is the dialect of the the books that we read, it's totally different, and Arabic is a very, very difficult language. In the school, they speak Arabic, not only. In the school, everything is written in the books, and the teacher was important to teach Arabic. The way they spoke, uh, a Muslim wouldn't understand that. <laughs> it is Arabic but it's not really the same thing, it's a different dialect. Our situation in Baghdad was wonderful. We had a very good life, we had beautiful schools, French schools, high education, comfortable life, we had very good businesses, it was just great. They occupied many, many uh, interesting jobs in the, in the railroad, in uh, uh, in commerce, they were merchants. Most of the people, the Iraqi Jewish people, used to work in uh, business, like uh, uh, import uh, food, uh, import materials, sugar, uh, tea, because there is nothing they can do in the country. They, they used to have uh, very big houses with lots of maids and everything. They were very rich and very well off. From stories from my family, the Jews were very successful uh, business people. They traded on the Silk Road where they took camel caravans from Baghdad to India to China where they traded goods and brought them back. Legend has it that my great-grandfather had a caravan of camels and did travel the Silk Road. My father used to have uh, several kinds of businesses in his life. My father had movie theaters. He brought the movie theater to the country. He built a movie in every one of the states. The Rashid Cinema, it was called, and Roxy Cinema, and uh, those are from movies from uh, in the United States. Mostly Metro Golden Maya, he has the one with it. And um, we used to love the American movies. We used to dress up like America. We used to fix our hair like the movie stars. After that, he decided, why don't I take uh, a, a theater, not a theater, a studio to make the movies in Baghdad. Why should I go and get the movies from uh, the state and everything? So he decided, he made a company with the stocks 
and bought a lot of uh, a lot of people had stocks with it, and he made a big uh, studio. They were able to educate themselves and learn English and French, so they were uh, a very integral part for these different for the British rule. They were able to uh, garner jobs and to uh, keep a very comfortable existence in the land. The Iraqi Jews were, were, you know, they like to stay by themselves. They don't want to mingle with other people because they're scared. You know, they don't want to mingle with the Muslim or the Christian or what. And uh, it was a small community, actually not small. There were about 130,000 Jews in Iraq. And uh, we, we stayed with the family all the time, relatives, family. And we mind our business, so not to get in trouble. I used to go to the synagogue with my mother. It was ancient, like very, very old and traditional. And there were the rabbi houses in our street. They had like a um, street was very narrow when we were downtown Baghdad. And because they were afraid to walk in the street when they were dressed up and they had lots of jewelry, they had like a bridge from one house to another above the street to go back and forth. The, the Jewish people had their own, we were like the creme de la creme. The houses along the river, 100% were owned by Jewish people. It was good. We have our own house, we had our maids, we have a chauffeur and driver, and uh, it was good, but things got bad very quickly. June 1st, 1941 marked the beginning of the hostilities between the Jews and Arab Muslims in Iraq, interrupting over 2,500 years of peaceful coexistence. The Farhud was a Nazi-supported pogrom in which hundreds of Jews were killed in Baghdad over the span of two days. Afterwards, relationships between Jews and Arabs in the country continued to deteriorate. In 1941, there was a big massacre called Farhud, where a lot of Iraqi Jews were massacred, and a lot of the houses were confiscated and stolen and a whole bunch of people left the country. It was like a big change from one government to another. And every time there was a persecution, a whole bunch of people left. I was at the age of seven, I think, when they had the Farhud. And uh, I used to go to school before I left. And every time I went there, it was in a Muslim neighborhood, and they used to kick me and throw manure on me going to school. It was very frightening. I was a very young girl, maybe 12 years old or 13 years old, and my fa ma mother and uh, the other families around the house, they were talking that they are killing other people and loot, looting the, the furniture and everything. And my mother took us all in a very uh, the downstairs in the very small basement to stay there if they will go and uh, did uh, damage our house, they will not kill us. And that's where we stayed there. My parents decided that we should, at least two children will be safe outside Iraq if something happened to them. So me and my brother left Iraq and went to the boarding school, Whittingham College, Jewish school. It was very difficult, but they, have, they had to do it because they wanted at least some of the family to be alive if something happens in Baghdad. There was a, some kind of time when the, they wouldn't let any Jewish people go to colleges there. So a lot of uh, my friends and everybody just went to England and anywhere else 
out of the country, mostly the boys, so that they can get more education than just the high school. There were no more um, men <laughs> left eligible and I, they wanted me to get married. So there was nobody, because I told you before, all the friends of mine, every man, they went out of the country to get more education, so there were not many men left. So I went out and uh, I met my husband, Edward Deere, in Israel, I got married. It was after the Farhud that the underground movements began to smuggle Jews from Iraq to Palestine. And though it died down by the mid-40s, the creation of Israel proved a major turning point in the migration of Iraqi Jews to the new state. When Israel came in 1948 and the division of Palestine happened, the Arab people turned against the Jewish people in the Arab countries. And we were Jewish people in an Arab country. So life became very difficult for us. Everybody was unemployed, there was no money, you were not allowed to sell, not allowed to buy, no passport, nothing. And it was intolerable. Finally, a law was announced called the Taskit. Any Jew who wanted to leave could relinquish his Iraqi citizenship and go to Israel. Of the 150,000 Iraqi Jews, more than 100,000 filed for exit. So they made it possible for anybody who wants to go to Israel or leave the country to relinquish their nationality and leave. And 90% of the people, the Jewish people, left. Like my brother Maurice and Eli and my friends. In a class of like 60 girls, only four were left. All of them went to Israel in 1950. Unrestricted emigration of Jews from Iraq to Israel only lasted until the mid-1950s. From then until the early 1970s, no passports were administered to the Jews. It was in this period that the number of illegal escapes to neighboring countries reached its apex. When they started having uh, Israel and uh, uh, people were uh, trying to go to Israel, so they won't get passport with them. And uh, some people make uh, some kind of companies and they take people, they take some money from them and they went through to Iran or Turkey illegally so they can then to go to Israel. My sister, her husband, and the kids were leaving Baghdad, and my mother decided that I should leave Baghdad with them. And I left Baghdad to go to Persia, and that was illegally because they wouldn't give us passports. My husband, Ruben, grew a beard, and we borrowed some Abbas, and my sister Margot was unmarried, and there were no guys in the country left. So we took her with us. So we left our car in the driveway, our house was intact, the furniture was all there, we had a lot of crystals, magnificent porcelain, silver, everything. And uh, we didn't even tell anybody. So we had to travel, first uh, we had to go by some cab, go to the border of Iran. A while they were racing to the border, he hit a guy in the car, and it was a big problem. My brother-in-law just told him, just keep on moving, because we would be caught, and we don't have any passports, and we are Jewish people dressed up in Arab people. We were uh, dressed up in the black thing for the woman. And so he just ran, took us to the border, and then he went back and faced the person. And we had to cross the border, which was uh, a river, a small river, Basra is a city in the south of Iraq. And Basra has a big river called Shat al-Arab, means the river of the Arabs. And that river has two sides. One side is Iraq, and the other side is Iran. The smugglers were two brothers. One of them living in the Arab side, the Iraqi side, and the other lives in the Iranian side and they had a submerged little boat it was a metal boat 
and they pulled it by a rope, which was half full of water, and it was the 16th of December. It was half ice, very, very, very cold. He said, sit down. I said, but it's all what? Water. He said, sit down, we are telling you, you want to go across or not? And I had to go in and throw every, all our belongings and my new shoes and everything in the water so that we can run before the troll come and catch us. Anyway, finally, the boat took us to the Iranian side. Then the, they took the boat and they sank it so that they won't show. The patrol will not see that people are. And from then uh, there, there were some people who helped us to get some kind of uh, car to go to Israel. The Iranian brother took us to the Jewish agency. We were traveling and I had to uh, wear this black thing in there. and. Uh, the long black that the Arab women wear and when we were at the border it just kept on falling down and one of the women looked at me and she said I know you don't wear these things at all because <laughs> I had blonde hair and I was wearing that black thing and she recognized right away that so we were just rushing so that we go somewhere safe and they were Israelis and Iranians together that they made it safe for us to go and cross. And they were very nice. They took. They knew we were coming. They had our names. They had our ages. They gave us a paper called laissez passer, which means those people have no real passport. They have no papers, but you have to let them permission to travel, so that we could sit on a train, and and the train took us to Tehran, and we stayed in Tehran for three months until our papers were arranged. And I went to Israel with my, uh, my sister, her husband, and her children. And so it was just a very scary ex experience. It was really very hard, and I'm glad we came out of it alive. <laughs> Unfortunately, many Jews were unsuccessful in escaping. Hundreds were imprisoned and even executed because of their own failed attempts at escape or the escape of family members. And my mother also left, but they caught her. And she had to stay in somewhere like a prison for like a month until they let her go back. They stayed for a month and a half in prison until I think uh, people from uh, United States Jewish people and the Israeli people started making a fun of it. People are, they took the Jewish people, they do them this, that, eh? so they took, uh, they let them to go out from the prison and came in. One day the police did come and knock on our door and spoke with my father and I remember being very scared about it. And it was just after my grandmother and my uncle were tried to escape and they were caught. And uh, when they were caught, it was agreed upon that it, my father would take responsibility so that if they were to try to leave again, that he would be responsible. And what happened was that they indeed did escape and then my father was put in jail for a few weeks. I went to talk about it to the police station. They came and they asked me why your uh, husband is coming. So I talked to them and I told the policemen that my, uh, me and my husband, we never knew they were going away uh, on the border. And after that, so they accepted what I said about it and they, they took my husband out of the prison to stay with him. And it was a very scary time uh, because we didn't know whether or not he was going to come back. When we left Iraq in December of 66, the situation was not as bad as after the Six Day War. In June of 1967, when we were here about six months, the war broke up and in six days all the 
Egyptian army was dismantled, their air force was totally blown out. The Arab people turned completely crazy. And the situation in Baghdad became very, very difficult. After the Six Day War, life in Iraq for the Jews became very difficult. The Iraqi government blamed the Jews for Iraq's involvement in the Six Day War and for the losses that they suffered through the Six Day War. They, at that point, did not allow Jews to leave the country. They did not uh, allow them to work. They took away their ability to uh, study in major universities. And they began to terrorize them. The telephones were cut out. They, they didn't, uh, nobody was allowed to work. Like my cousin Fuad, they took his job. He had a partner. They took his business away. Everybody had to sit home, basically. A lot of people left across the border with very difficult hardships. A lot of people were killed in the prisons and tortured. Many people went missing. Um, wives report that their husbands did not come home from work and they never saw them again. A lot of my friends, like my friend Joyce, her husband Shaul, he was taken out of his home, he was tortured to death, and every two weeks they come and turn her mattresses and tell her that she's hiding money and they tell her where is her husband. She told him you took him and you killed him. How are you going to ask me where he is? Uh, many people were jailed. Uh, saying that they were spies for the land of Israel, and uh, at some point there was a public hanging. It was in the news that uh, a bunch of people were taken to uh, prison and they were tortured a lot, and I think 11 of them were hanged. The Jews were, who were previously killed were then put up and hung so that everyone could see them and rejoice that the Iraqi government had caught some Jewish spies living in Baghdad. They were very mean to, to everybody who stayed behind. They had a lot of people in the prison, and uh, this is the time when the Ba'ath came, like Saddam Hussein came and stuff. So the situation became much worse after the June 67 war than it was when we left in December of 66 that after the Six Day War, families were split apart. We had a very large family within this Jewish community at that point. It was probably about 10 or 12,000 people. And many of our family members went to Israel, some went to Canada, some went to England, some went to the United States. So it was really a splitting up of families all over the world because of this persecution. We stayed behind because of the fear uh, that we would get caught. We were one of the last families in Baghdad. And in 1972, the uh, American Red Cross and other um, organizations protested and said that the Iraq was treating their Jews harshly. So for a very short window, Iraq allowed uh, some of their Jews to leave, and we were in that uh, group. It was very difficult to leave everything behind. My parents just literally left our house. We didn't sell our properties. The guy said, if you want, I have a guy who will buy your furniture. He said, fine, we'd like to sell them. So a guy came and said, hi, how much do you want for the whole house? I mean, I had curtains that were like $50 a yard. I had, my husband had a very, very good business, and he had a lot of money. Everything we had was the best and the most expensive. He said, well, I'll give you 100 pounds for the whole house. So we told him, I mean, even one chair is much more than 100 pounds. He said, oh, where are you going tomorrow? He knew that we were going across the border. So my husband said, okay, give me the 100 pounds. The house will be yours. I mean, the furniture and the curtains and everything he could have. We took just whatever few belongings we could take with us. I was uh, only seven years old, so for me, I remember taking my stuffed bunny, which I still have, and a doll, but um, and a few pieces of clothing, but not much else. We do have photographs uh, that we brought along with us.
I was very grateful that my uh, sister and her husband would take the, me with them. It's a big responsibility to do that and take somebody which we didn't know whether we're going to make safely or anything. So it was very nice of them that we did that. The river and the places and everything, I miss it and I'd like to see it again. But the way it is, I, I think they, are, they even have our house which was very beautiful. They just destroyed it and destroyed everything. There are some things that are disappearing that we used to love, but they are not being used that much. Well, the Iraqi Jews have many unique traditions that set us apart from uh, other Jews, both Sephardic and Ashkenazi. Um, one, on Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, uh, we uh, have a, a plate similar to the Passover Seder, Seder plate, where we eat different foods that symbolize things. And one of the foods that we eat is cow's tongue. It says that it means let us pray that we are going to be at the head of things and not at the end, at the tail of things. Like if you go to school, you want to be among the first, not among the last. On Passover, we um, there's a tradition called Sunta Kudra, so that at the end of Passover we celebrate that the spring is coming and we take a branch of green leaves and we playfully hit each other with it and say Sunta Kudra, wishing each other a happy and prosperous green year. The food we still eat, we don't have to worry about it. I can cook uh, the rice and the chicken, I can cook kubaburgel, I can cook masha. The best one I like is the kibba, barmia. It's an okra with meatballs covered with rice pasta. Shish kebab and uh, chicken and rice, that's what they like. The best is the tibet. It's a chicken, a whole chicken, and it's stuffed, and then it's cooked with rice, and you have to put it that. Usually they used to eat it on Friday, make it on Friday night, and eat it on Saturday. It stays like 12 hours until very slow heat, and that was my favorite dish. We still speak the language. We, have, we do the food. We socialize with a lot of Iraqi people. And we still hold on to a lot of the customs that we brought with us. We were actually brought up there. I want to say one thing that I'm glad I'm in here in America. It is perfect. And uh, I thank God for not getting hurt, me and my family. And uh, we are happy here. We left Iraq, but Iraq has not left us.